me to turn to the book of Hebrews, where we will read from the first chapter, the ninth verse. I want to study with you this evening about the greatest thing in the world, it's love. This evening we're going to study about love that hates, love that hates. Will you read the text with me? Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. It is easy to relate love and happiness. But where does the hate come in? Love that hates. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. We shall never know the depths of love, or the height of love, or the breadth of love, until we know experimentally the love that hates, the love that hates. Love, of course, comes from God. And this text is addressed by the Father to the Son, as you note in the 8th verse. Unto the Son, he, that is the Father, saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Christ is the supreme manifestation of God's love, and he is also the outstanding demonstration of the hatred of God, love that hates, love that hates. We're in a generation where the word love is used in many ways, often in a weak, sentimental manner. But the love of God is strong, strong enough to hate. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. The climax of this revelation is at the cross. Do we want to see the love of God in all eternity? The great manifestation of that love is at Calvary. Oh, what a wonderful demonstration of love Jesus gave when he died for us. But ah, do you know what broke his heart? It was not only love for righteousness, but hatred for sin. And if you and I want to echo that love and that hatred, that love that hates, if we will look at Calvary, look to Calvary, we shall see demonstrated not only a love that we will respond to in admiration, but we will see the character of Satan manifested, demonstrated, revealed in such a way that our hatred for sin will deepen as our love for righteousness heightens. The two are different parts of the same experience. You see, there is no way to love righteousness without hating iniquity. May I repeat that? There is no way to love righteousness without hating iniquity. There is no way to love someone I love deeply without hating that which would endanger them. And so the love of God for his children leads him to hate the sin which would separate them from him. And our love for God will lead us not only to admire his divine character, but to hate everything that would separate us from him. Sin brings separation. Sin brings separation. In the change that takes place when a man is converted to God, there is a complete reversal so the things that we once loved, we now hate, and the things that we once hated, we now love. You will find that beautifully expressed in the book, Steps to Christ, page 58. This is the evidence of being born again. 
The unconverted person loves many things that God hates, and therefore he hates many things that God loves. But when we have passed from death unto life, when we love as God loves, we also hate as he hates. I mention that we are in a generation that is foggy and fuzzy on these things. Let me give you an example of it. In the book Great Controversy, page 571, speaking of the popular churches of today that profess to love Jesus Christ and that talk a great deal about love, it says false charity has blinded their eyes. What's another word for charity? Love. False love, false charity has blinded their eyes. They do not see but that it is right to believe good of all evil. And as the inevitable result, they will finally believe evil of all good. Oh, think of it, dear friends. When you and I get that false charity so that we can put our arms around sin and say we're all going to the same place, just different roads, when we embrace wickedness and lawlessness in the name of love and charity. I say when we do that, we are getting ready, whether we realize it or not, to strike the dagger right into the heart of those who are loyal to Jesus Christ in his commandments in the final crisis. Sin is a deceiver. And although it uses the vocabulary of love, its final end is the assassination of those who cling to loyalty to the Creator. Let me read this sentence again in Greek Controversy. False charity has blinded their eyes. They do not see but that it is right to believe good of all evil. And as the inevitable result, they will finally believe evil of all good. When we think of the terrible crimes, the awful sins that are now being invited into the professed churches of Christ, when we think of the open immorality that is not only winked at, but encouraged in the name of love and charity, receiving everybody, don't cut out anybody. When we see how all the commandments of God are dragged in the dust in the name of love and charity, we can see how this is being fulfilled. And don't forget, dear friends, eventually it leads to hating those that love the Lord. Turn to Second Chronicles, the 19th chapter, a very interesting experience. This is a story in the life of King Jehoshaphat. Now, Jehoshaphat was a very good king. He's one of the outstanding good kings of the southern kingdom of Judah. But in the 18th chapter, we find him engaged in a questionable enterprise. He's gone up to be friendly with King Ahab. Well, isn't it nice to be friendly? Well, it all depends on what the purpose, what the motive is, and how it's done. What was Ahab? Ahab was one of the most wicked of the kings of Israel. Now Israel was a part of the chosen people of God. And I don't know, I cannot read Jehoshaphat's mind, it may be that he thought he could do some good missionary work by going up there with Ahab. At any rate, they had quite a feast up there. And King Ahab said, now listen, I'm about to engage in a war with a heathen neighbor, the king of Syria, and I wish that you'd go with me to the war. And do you know what Jehoshaphat said? He said, I'll do it. My people will be just as your people, my soldiers as your soldiers, my weapons as your weapons. We'll go together, and we will whip the heathen. Well, the whole story is quite interesting. The king of Israel lost his life before that battle was over. But I want you to notice what the Lord's prophet said 
to King Jehoshaphat as he came back from that experience. Second Chronicles, the 19th chapter, and the second verse. Prophets, you know, have sometimes a painful job. They have to point out the displeasure of God over things that people think are wonderful. The spirit of prophecy is God's agency for reproving sin and pointing out snares and traps. So, Jehu, the son of Hanani, Jehu was a prophet. He was a seer, it calls him here. He went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldst thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Quite a lesson to ponder, dear friend. Quite a lesson to ponder. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, even though they may bear the name of following God. We want to be sure that in our zeal to be friendly, we do not discount the law of God. We want to be sure that in our desire to be loving and charitable, we do not cooperate with the enemies of God. Now that's from the Old Testament. Let's turn over to James, the fourth chapter in the fourth verse, and read the same thing put strong and clear from the New Testament. James 4.4. 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Six thousand years ago, when Lucifer introduced rebellion into the universe of God, began the great controversy. And it began with a war in heaven. John writes of it in Revelation, the 12th chapter, verses 7 to 9. War in heaven. Every angel had to take his stand. Every angel had to choose his side. Every angel experienced either pushing out some other angel or being pushed out. Turn and read it in Revelation 12, 7 to 9. Good angels, good angels, God's angels, holy angels fight? Yes, they would fight, friends. They loved righteousness. And God taught them that true love hates iniquity. Revelation 12, 7 to 9. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Notice that Michael, that is Christ, and his angels did what? They fought. Can love fight? Oh, yes, love will fight. Love will fight to uphold the high standards of God. Love will stand for loyalty against rebellion. Love will have no part in an armistice with iniquity. Love will have no part in lowering the standards. Love will fight. Love will hate. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Turn over to the 139th Psalm, verses 21 and 22. An inspired affirmation from King David. Psalm 139, verses 21 and 22. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Somebody may be thinking, how are we going to help people 
with that attitude. It's the only way to help people, dear friend. Jehoshaphat's trip to join affinity with Ahab and have a great feast and join with the violators of God's law didn't help anybody. It caused the death of some people. Balaam was successful in getting Israel, you remember, there in the plains of Baal Peor near Jordan to come to the feasts and the musicals and the concerts, the dances of the Moabites. And what was the result? It led into idolatry and immorality. The music of this world, my friends, is no place for the Christian. The amusements of this world are no place for the Christian. The social life of this world leads away from God. And the true follower of God loves souls so much that he will not unite in sin in the name of charity. And now that doesn't mean, dear friend, that we're talking about a lack of true love. I'm talking about real love. Desire of Ages sums it up so beautifully in 462. Desire of Ages 462. Men hate the sinner while they love the sin. Christ hates the sin but loves the sinner. This will be the spirit of all who follow him. Isn't that beautifully said and so true? Men hate the sinner while they love the sin. But Christ hates the sin, yet loves the sinner. This will be the spirit of all who follow him. I'm told that in some parts of South America, there is a serpent whose bite is so poisonous that a person bitten with that snake dies very shortly. One of our missionaries tells of seeing a young man with his hand cut off at the wrist. He heard his story. He and his father were out on the trail. This young man was bitten by this poisonous snake. And the father at once took his machete and chopped off the boy's hand at the wrist. Why? His only hope of life. Was that love? Oh, yes, friends, that was love. That was love. That was love. Love that hates that which would destroy life. That, and if, if love would lead a parent to do something desperate to save the human mortal life of a son, oh, what should our attitude be in seeking to save for eternity those for whom Jesus died? Love suffers long and is kind, but love can hate. Love does hate. In fact, the more we love a person, the more we hate the thing that is going to separate them from us, from God, and from all that's beautiful and wonderful. Isn't that right? No way to have one without the other. No way to have one without the other. Second Corinthians, the third chapter, the 18th verse. something very interesting about the human mind, the human heart, the human spirit. The human soul is so made by God that man can become altogether like God or altogether like Satan. What we behold changes us. We all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are what? Are changed. Changed into what? The same image. From glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. How many of you folks here tonight have a camera? May I see your hands? Yeah. What do you put in that camera? Film. And every now and then, you open the eye of that camera, and you get what? You get a picture. You get a picture. And every time you and I open these eyes, 
we get a picture, a whole series of pictures, not on photographic film, but on the imperishable records of the human mind. Oh, how careful then we should be what we look at, because if we look at Jesus, we will come to love him more and more and hate sin. But looking at sin, don't miss this, looking at sin does not lead us at last to hate sin. As the poet has said, vice is a monster of such frightful mean as to be hated needs but to be seen, yet seen to oft. Familiar with her face, we first endure, then pity and embrace. Millions have done it, friends. It's possible to look at something and the first time we see it, we are horror-stricken at the idea that anybody would think of doing such a terrible, awful, sinful, wicked thing. But if we keep looking at it, whether it's on TV or anywhere else, friends, if we keep looking at it, the time will come when we can tolerate it. And the time will come that we will admire it. And the time will come that we'll do it. God pity us, my friends that he may give us a love that hates sin and that recoils from the first encounter with it. Beholding, we are changed. Do we want to be like Jesus? Let us behold him. That's why God gave us in the Bible the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Each, inspired by the Holy Spirit, pen those lines that enable us now as we read, to see the Savior in his earth life. From Bethlehem to Nazareth to Jordan to Capernaum to Jerusalem to Calvary, the resurrection morning and the ascension, and then as we study those wonderful books of Hebrews and Leviticus and Daniel and Revelation, we see him in his heavenly mediatorial ministry. We follow him from earth to heaven, from the holy place to the most holy place, to the mercy seat, the sprinkled blood and the smoking censer, and the prayers of our Lord all become very real to us. And the more we look, the more we appreciate and admire that wonderful character written out in the Ten Commandments, lived out in the life of our Lord, and beholding, we yield to those wonderful influences of the Holy Spirit and we are changed. We come to love what he loves and to hate what he hates. This is the effectual way to win souls, my dear friend, not by compromising, not by lowering the standard, but by lovingly, prayerfully, kindly, seeking to turn the eyes of men to the Savior who has given his life rather than leave man to perish in his iniquity. Oh, that God may give us that experience. What do you say? Turn to Proverbs, the 23rd chapter, the 26th verse. Just as we cannot sow weeds and reap a good crop, we cannot sow beholding the wickedness of this world and reap a character that is worth harvesting for heaven. And so Jesus invites us to turn our eyes to him, to turn our hearts to him. My son, give me thine heart. Would you read that with me? My son, give me thine heart. Will we do it? That's enough. Uh, the rest is all right, but I want you to focus on that. My son, give me thine heart. Again together. My son, give me thine heart. Do you know that's the only thing you and I have to give to Jesus that he doesn't already have? Money is, as far as money is concerned, he's got plenty of it. He's got a universe filled with all kinds of material wealth. But there's one thing you and I have that we can give him our choice, our love. And if we will give him our hearts, 
he will put in our hearts that love for him which will lead us to resist the devil and yield to Jesus. My son, give me thine heart. My daughter, give me thine heart. My child, give me thine heart. Oh, I am so glad that I have a choice that I can give my heart to Jesus. What do you say? Give me thy heart, says the Father above. No gift so precious to him as our love. Softly he whispers wherever thou art. Gratefully trust me and give me thy heart. I'm so glad, dear friends, that we can be changed, aren't you? If as we came in these doors tonight, there was in our hearts some love for sin, some cherished idol, thank God we don't need to take it with us. We can give it to Jesus. We can give it to Jesus. We need not leave disloyal to the Son of God. We need not leave in any foggy, fuzzy, uncertain condition. We can leave knowing 
that our will is with Jesus 100%. The miracle of his grace is for all who will let him operate. Heart surgery is indicated, and the great surgeon is ready to officiate. Oh, I thank God that he can circumcise our hearts, that he can take away those desires that would entwine about the things of sin and rebellion, and that he can give us new loves, new admiration, new desires that entwine about Jesus and the things of heaven. It's a miracle, dear friends, that God's been doing it for 6,000 years. There are men and women here tonight, I know, that have had their lives completely changed so that truly things they used to love, they hate now. And things they used to despise, they love with all their hearts. God can do it for everyone. Oh, what a wonderful privilege to learn to enjoy things that last for eternity. To enter into an experience with God that will never, never end. Is there somebody here tonight that has never given his heart to Jesus fully? who wants to do it, will do it tonight, I want you to stand right where you are and we'll pray for you. Somebody that has never given yourself fully to Jesus, but you will tonight. Make a full surrender and give him your heart. Is there somebody here tonight that once knew the Master, but you wandered away? You want to come back and put your hand in his tonight? Will you stand? I want to pray for you. You're precious to the Lord, my friend. Precious, precious to Jesus. The fact that you knew him once, oh, he wants your love once more. Will you stand and say, by standing, yes, Lord, I'm coming back to you. I'm putting my hand once more in the hand that was nailed to the cross for me. We stand for him here, he stands for us up there. He confesses us before the Father. We confess him before me. Somebody that Jesus is calling. Yes, I'm coming back. Another question. Is there somebody here that while you've been following Jesus professedly, you recognize tonight that there has been in your heart and life a love for things that you know God hates? And tonight, you want to seek God for an experience in loving only what God loves and hating what God hates. If there's somebody like that, I wish you'd stand. All to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender Brother Boykin, would you come up and pray for us? Let's all kneel together on behalf of these and any others that God may be calling. Our kind and merciful Heavenly Father, we know that thy sweet presence has been here tonight to show us the beauty of thy love and also the beauty of thy hatred, thy hatred of sin. We want this experience, dear Father, and we see that both of these aspects must exist in our hearts as it is in thine if we are to be balanced. We pray with all of our hearts that the Holy Spirit will come into us and show us how terrible sin is. It has crucified our best friend. It has brought untold woe on the universe, this world especially. We ourselves have felt the, its sting. 
its awfulness, its misery, its bitterness, its woe, and we are sick of it. Oh, Lord, tonight we want to join the army of heaven, the angels of God who excel in strength and push sin out of our lives and be influential in helping to bring about the cleansing of the universe. Thank God. Oh, Lord, we're sorry that we broke thy heart, that our sins put thee to shame on that cruel cross. Thank thee that there is forgiveness, there is cleansing as we come to the cross and see those blood drops, see that heart that was broken. Lord, we thank thee that tonight we can be free in thee and we can take a step forward toward the kingdom of God. As we've heard this wonderful announcement of how we are to hate sin and love righteousness, Give us grace to do it now. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. Be seated. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee, O the folly of sin, I resign. My grace. go home, we're going to have a little witness session. This evening, I'm requesting that our witnesses be list, limited to one sentence each. If you have something that needs longer than that, you keep it for another evening. But I'd like to have a line of people on this side coming right across here. You may come now. All who will give your witness for Jesus, your expression of loyalty and love, come. And let's make heaven's arches ring with thanksgiving and praise to the one who loves us and gave himself for us. Angels sing in heaven. You and I give our praises here, and he's especially glad to hear it. Oh, I know he has something sweet and precious for us tonight. I love the Lord Jesus, who is able to keep me from falling. Thank the Lord. I'm thankful for the love of God, uh, who has... Uh, taught me to hate iniquity. I want to be through with criticism. Thank God. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I'm thankful that the same God that is bringing out the buds and opening them is the same God that through his word can create a new heart in me. Amen. I choose to keep my eyes fixed on Jesus and I may become like him. I love my Jesus. And I want to be in full cooperation as he pushes all this out of my life. I thank the Lord for his love and for the promise that he will finish the work that he started in us. I'm thankful tonight for all that the Lord is doing and has done in my life. I choose to love that which God loves. I'd also like to thank the Lord for his love. The longer I go in my new Christian life, uh, the more I realize how much Jesus loves me. He does. I find more and more that in smooth times and hard times, the Lord's grace is more than adequate. It is our vengeance if we should be saved in the end. We must learn the lessons of humiliation and penitence at the foot of the cross. There was joy in heaven that the sons of Adam could now, through a life of obedience, be exalted finally to the presence of God. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus...